I get it. You're here to show me my past and I'm supposed to get all doughy-eyed and mushy. Well, forget it, pal. You got the wrong guy. That's exactly what Attila the Hun said. We're talking 80s Christmas favorites. Hit it. It was the 1980s. Leg warmers were in. MTV debuted. Construction began on the Channel Tunnel, and the decades movies and specials were rad. I'm your host, Jerry D, with another episode of Totally Rad Christmas, the podcast that talks all things Christmas in the 80s. Toys, movies, specials, music, and fads. If it was gnarly during Christmas in the 80s, we got it covered. And joining me is a very special guest. You'll know him as the host of the way awesome but brand new Behind the Bells podcast, Robert Nicholas. Robert, how's it going? Going good. I can't believe it. My only one episode up, and I'm already a guest. This must be what success feels like. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. I was I was a, a guest before I had any episodes, so uh, I, yeah, it was kind of <laughs> kind of the same feeling there. Just like yeah. <laughs> no, um, I liked your show. I know you you only had the one drop so far, but but it was really entertaining. So I learned a lot. All right, well, thank you. I got I got part two of my episode, the, of Santa, the Santa Claus, Claus coming yeah. out later this next next week, and then my next episode will be a series on Scrooged. <gasps> Excellent. I, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> so I can't wait. That's going to be fun. I know uh, there was a lot of trouble on that shoot. Oh, yeah. Because uh, unfortunately, even though I love Richard Donner and I love Bill Murray, but like some people, there are just some people you do not put together. And yeah. That yeah. just happened to be a pair that was never going to work. You know, um, Bill Murray often talks about, and I know we're kind of getting off topic here, but that's okay. Bill Murray often talks about how um, the script that he read was really good and that it just wasn't the same script that they ended up shooting really. And so it kind of really makes me wonder like what would have happened had they gone with that original shooting script, you know, like, yeah, it would have been interesting. uh, Cause that, that's one of those scenarios where I'm not quite sure if the director was trying to improvise part of the script that he had already worked with, or maybe the studio came in and rewrote parts of it. And that's, that's primarily what I'm doing my, right now with my research to gather all that together so I can flesh out a better story for my podcast. Right on. Well, I look forward to hearing it. Today, when I asked you to be on, you know, you, you said you kind of just wanted to talk about holiday favorites and, and you know, maybe some that are not so favorite. And so, uh, oh, yeah. So I had an idea of why don't we talk about our like top five. It doesn't have to be in any particular order. So it doesn't have to be like your number one. It could just be, you know, like your five favorite ones. And then, um, you know, maybe like two or three that are pretty not so top. And so I like to call them the Kevins and the Buzz. Or, uh, or if you want ah. the uh, the Todd and the the Clarks, I don't know, whatever, however you want to break it down. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited to do this because I normally don't rank anything, and so uh, this this is going to be fun. I bet so because uh, I expect my list here to not be an official ranking because part of my problem is because I'm viewing new holiday stuff all the time, old and new. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's never exactly a consistent list of stuff that I can easily rank. Is even if I were to rank it, given it in maybe five years, it's going to just it's just going to change just again. Going to change again. Yep, I totally get that, and I'm not quite as similar. Although I understand because I'm like that with a lot of uh, with, with a lot of other things like comic books and stuff like that. Well, with oh, my yeah. Christmas movies, I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty set with my at least my top four. You know, everything else underneath, you know, like six through 10 kind of, kind of change, but top four is always, it's always there, but let's get into it. I'm excited to talk about it. Let's start off with the Kevin McAllister's first, you know, these top dogs that uh, were pretty awesome. I asked you to do five. What is your number five? Okay. If I had to pick number five, I am picking, oddly enough, a TV movie called A Hobo's Christmas. <laughs> Nice. I can't say I'm familiar with that one. It sounds interesting, though. Tell me about A Hobo's Christmas. 
Okay, well, basically, the whole premise revolves around, well, a hobo who rides into Salt Lake City with his other hobo friends, who has basically decided to go visit his son, who he has not seen in many, many years. And after contemplating whether he really should be doing this, he goes to the nearby YMCA, gets a shower, puts on his first brand new shirt in years, and just goes to go see his son and his grandkids he's never met. Interesting. Uh, and is even there any though kind of... on, the, on the surface, it does sound like it could easily be a very schmaltzy and very predictable story. Yes. But to its credit, uh, it actually takes a lot of turns. You know, like, for example, you know how with something like this kind of project, by the third act, there's usually an argument that forces somebody to walk out? Yep. Well, in this movie's case, the argument actually happens much earlier, more like within the 35 minute time frame. Oh, wow. Getting that cliche out of the way. And That's the cool. rest of the movie, while not necessarily the most exciting, it's very calm and very relaxing and kind of feels more like one of those laid back Christmas movies. That, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't necessarily have to pay attention the whole time. You can easily just rest on the couch and. Just sit back and enjoy Christmas with this other family that's experiencing a uh, Christmas with a grandpa for the first time. See, and that's pretty awesome. Um, my grandparents or my my grandpas, because my, my grandmas were, were still alive, but my grandpas, both of them passed away when I was really young. So okay. it would be nice to to have that kind of Christmas with the grandpa feel, you know, uh, as as a as a young kid. So I I think that would be really cool, especially, you know, meeting him for the first time, like, who's this guy? But then at the same time, it's like, but he's my grandpa, you know, kind of a feeling. And just you you have that that um, that duality of emotion there where, you know, it's like you want to embrace him, but you also kind of want to you distrust him because you're not sure. Oh, yeah. Especially considering uh, that they do go into detail on why this guy became became a hobo. Again, not a homeless person, uh, but a hobo, somebody who <laughs> roughs it by choice. Yeah. That's and really dwells into that whole psychology of not wanting to stay in the same place uh, for a long period of time. And yeah, what's weird is I think a lot of modern day people could really relate to that, especially a lot of those like Instagram travelers that uh, are always in different places all the time. And yeah, oh yeah, for real. Uh, I mean, like you mentioned, just nowadays. Uh, well, maybe not nowadays, but <laughs> with, with, not this year, at least. But, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. In modern times, yeah, there is a, a whole lot more of that. Um, the only hobo movie I've ever really seen is Hobo with the Shotgun, and so I imagine it's. Oh bad. yeah, I love that movie. Actually, <laughs> I don't care what other people say. That's a movie that I am willing to watch at least once a year. It's you know what it it's I wouldn't say it's a good movie, but it's definitely entertaining. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. It, it knows what it wants to be. Something that's very trashy, but something that would at least be rememberable uh, after you finished watching it. Oh, for sure. And Rugger Howard just kills it. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, and that also, speaking of stars, even though uh, uh, A Hobo's Christmas doesn't have any big names, mm -hmm. it does have one actor that us Christmas aficionados would recognize. Really? You remember William Hickey from Christmas Vacation? I sure do. Yes, he's Uncle he Lewis. He plays one of the fellow hobo people uh, who's also <laughs> riding the wells with this guy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and even though he's not in an, uh, a whole lot, every scene he's in, he's always steal, he, yeah. always, he always steals each scene with whatever lines uh, the, he's given because he just has that real gravelly voice that yeah, yeah he does not many actors have today <laughs> you're not doing anything productive <laughs> yeah, anyway. yeah that's that's cool um i can't say i've ever seen it but now i kind of really want to go see it i'm interested in something like that so normally my number five would be miracle on 34th street which kind of counts because they showed it all throughout the 80s however for today's purposes, and uh, to stick within the guidelines of Totally Rad Christmas, my number five is actually Gremlins. Gremlins. Uh, enjoy the heck out of Gremlins. Is it a Christmas movie? I don't think so, but you know what? It is awesome. And there's enough Christmas in it uh, that I think you could argue just like you could for Die Hard that, you know, it uh, it is a Christmas movie. Yeah, it's funny because I would actually disagree. I actually do see Gremlins as a Christmas movie, despite oh, okay. the fact that it's it is obviously a bit more of a horror film for families. But right. yeah. whenever I really consider the overall story of what's going on, I actually would consider it more of a Christmas movie, considering that the whole story 
it's not just about a Christmas present that goes bad in this case, mm -hmm. but it's really about uh, these people, uh, Zach Gaffigan, uh, Phoebe, uh, Phoebe Katz, Phoebe and his Cates, father, yeah. mm -hmm. and they, even his mother, who has that awesome fight scene in the kitchen. They oh, all I know. come together you know, as a group, as this oddball family to basically save the town. See, I, I, this is one, and I mentioned in my Gremlins episode, um, it scared the heck out of me as a kid. You know, uh, the, the, the melting scene, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just whenever they would metamorphose, uh, I mean, just everything about it, you know, the, the creatures themselves. I mean, it was, it was scary, you know, when I saw it when I was four, uh, which I probably shouldn't have. But at the time, yeah. it, the way it was marketed was, you know, it was a, a nice little family film. And so, of course, uh, my parents took me to it. And yeah, the, it was nice with the Mogwai. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you Oh, know. yeah, suddenly it just turns that dark corner. And as soon as you see that uh, Mogwai becoming that cocoon, it's like, did we step into the alien franchise now? Pretty much, yeah. And so it was there was something about it that was there was um, you know, it was terrifying. But at the same time, watching it now as an adult, I love the the caroling gremlins because my family and yeah. I would go Christmas caroling every year. And so that is just that hits home. It's it's like sweet, but also, you know, just turned on its ear just enough to, you know, to to make it well funny, I should say, but also just a little terrifying. Yeah. That part, Phoebe Cates' monologue that I uh, mentioned earlier when she's talking about her dad. And, I mean, <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny, but it's it's funny. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, un unexpectedly considering how even the speech itself, when you really consider it, is kind of out of left field for the movie, considering that the whole plot stops just to allow just this to monologue to happen. <laughs> exactly. And even if you were to cut that scene out, nothing would have affected the overall story. Right. But that was but that was what made Joe Dante kind of smart that he knew that the story was just so surreal that it was just a lot funnier than it had any right to be. Well, and, and I love his other I mean, that's it's kind of very typical of, of like his other work. I mean, like you think about like the Burbs yeah. you know, or something like that, which is another favorite of mine. But I mean, it's stylistically it's so similar that, you know, they both have main characters that no one kind of really believes uh, about the stuff that's going on. And I mean, there's just, there's a lot of little quirky bits here and there enough elements that are um, typical of Joe Dante, you know, and his, his own personality that I think it, it just makes a great film. But in this one in particular, I just love, you know, like when she's waiting, uh, she's bartending for these gremlins. Like why, why would she do that? Why wouldn't she just run? You know, I mean, it's there's there's so many little details like that that it's just it's so typical of his of you know his sense of humor, but at the same time, just uh, it makes me laugh. And so I, I love the the Christmas of it all, even though it's it's not super Christmassy, uh, but it's Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Christmas, I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, because going back to my experience with that movie, uh, that was a movie that I didn't get a chance to see till way later. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, given that I was born in eighty uh, seven or so. Right. And oddly enough, if anything, I actually saw the sequel, Gremlins 2, before I saw the first one. I love Gremlins 2 also. <laughs> yeah, it's just that um, uh, uh, growing up with the, my parents, I was not allowed to watch the original Gremlins. Uh, right. Because yeah. there was at least five instances, I recall, going to the video store, grabbing it, my mother grabbing the VHS for me just to say, you are not seeing this. Go pick something else. Well, it's funny because part two, I think, was more... It leaned more into the comedy element, whereas the first one was had a little more horror, I think. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, I I don't know who said it, but someone compared Gremlins 2 to something like a live-action Looney Tunes movie. Basically. Yes, there was a lot of that, yeah. I, I And I, I agree. Uh, although, did you ever watch Key and Peele? I actually have yet to see that show. Okay, well, there, I never really watched it either, but every once in a while, my brothers or my friends would, would say, you got to watch this particular sketch. So there's a sketch where Joe Dante or, or Keys, um, you know, as Joe Dante, he's there with his writers and they're trying to pitch Gremlins 2. He's like, you know, and it starts off similar. He's like, this should write itself. It's Gremlins 2, you huh. know. And then there, you know, Peel comes in and he's like the Hollywood like script doctor kind of guy. Hmm. And so in the end, he's like, we're just going to brainstorm here. And so he just has it, all the <laughs> all the writers just toss out like crazy ideas for Gremlins. He's like, what about an electric gremlin? I love it. It's in the movie. You know, and of course, Key, that's Joe Dante. He's just like, like, well, what, what do you mean in the movie you know, this whole time? And it's a good sketch and you, you should check it out. It's just, it's kind of funny. What's your number four? Okay. So number four is Santa Claus, the movie. Ooh, that's a good one. 
That's so yeah. Good. Even though I uh, I understand why people don't like that one, uh, I understand that people don't like how the second act seems to go on a different tangent. It does. It, but, it it's definitely like two movies in one. But yeah, exactly. But I think what I really like about it uh, now is the fact that it is such a movie that embraces its its nineteen eighties feel to it or so. Yeah, it's very. Uh, I mean, that whole it, you know that style of New York. You know, it's very like Hell's Kitchen, uh, but at the same time, it's also you know very yuppie with uh, with John Lithgow there. You know, it's like like that typical yeah. it's like Wall Street ish. You know, he's he's just a you know the um, industrialist or whatever that uh, just doesn't care about the little guy and he just wants the money. And I mean, it's it's very eighties. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is, and especially uh, comparing to those other scenes, whether it's. Uh, that one uh, homeless kid you know, looking inside that Joe. McDonald's that is obviously, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, the most dated McDonald's ever see. Yeah. Or when uh, Patch is using his own sleigh and when he turns on the, the sleigh, it's, it clearly has Atari 2600 sound effects coming out of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so good. Um, but even that first half, just the entire first half, the North Pole, the elves, everything about it, the colors, it's just, it's really magical. And, and it is, kid, it's that's for the longest time. That's what I thought, you know, that's what I thought of when I thought of the North Pole. Yeah. yeah and in fact, uh, I think what also really uh, carries this movie for me is David Huddleston as Santa Claus. Yes. Considering that he doesn't really play the traditional type of Santa. I mean, he doesn't have the deep you know, deep booming ho ho kind of voice or so. Right. right. But he seems more like a genuine uh, toy maker who simply wants to spread his joy. And then of course, you know, cut to the modern day. And then of course, when Patch, you know, makes all those candy canes for this toy industrialist, you know, this is, this is what causes Santa to start having his little dilemma on his place. Mm -hmm. And, and even though it would have been nice to explore that a little more, still the movie kind of understands that it is catering to the family audience and thus, goes back to the storyline involving the two kids as they're right. uh, being rescued by Patra away from the uncle. Yes. Uh, and you're right. You're spot on about David Huddleston. He has that, uh, I think out of all the motion picture Santas, he's the most compassionate. At least he presents the most compassion and um, the most just joy, like out of all of them, he's the most joyful and and you can really see how much he cares for like the children or his even just his fellow you know elf co-workers and, and not that the others don't but i think he just does it the most you know he exactly just, considering he uh, that, just how much he really wants to make his elves feel good at work like for me a little detail that i especially like is when patch and that other elf had that little toy making contest to determine yeah. who gets to be manager right i really like how huddleston you know gives that other elf and I, I a genuine pat in the back for at least trying before giving patch the win. Right. Yeah. The, the, and um, I, I kind of wish with this, with that movie, cause it's one of my favorites, but I kind of wish that they had done just like the first half as a movie. And then the second half is like a sequel. And I think they, it would have been a lot more successful than it actually was. Probably because uh, I, I know the movie uh, was obviously not a big hit when it came out in theaters. Uh, right. Even though it was the passion project of the producers. Yes. Which is funny because I know um, uh, that the pair who made that movie were also famous for the infamous Supergirl movie that was made. <laughs> but they are also famous for making that other romance movie with uh, Christopher Reeve somewhere in time. The salt kinds, uh, you know, I mean, they're also infamous for their money management, I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the nicest way to say it. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of those where, yeah, if they had had more money and more time, I, I think they really could have done something amazing. And not that it's not amazing. I really enjoy it, but I think it could have been even more special. But right. A, Especially if they would have at least had time to get the script, uh, maybe one more rewrite or so. Yeah, I agree. Just needed one more pass and I think it would have been perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's a good pick. Uh, my number four is actually the Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh, it's one of those to me where it, I can't miss it or it just doesn't feel like Christmas. Like I have to watch it every Christmas. Yeah, and that's it, just a part of your official Christmas schedule. Exactly. Yeah, it's every year. It's it's somewhere in there, usually around the third week. I have to sit down and watch this thing. If I can watch it with my family, even better. But uh, just as long as I can watch it. <laughs> Some days yes. you, know, you just try to sneak it in where you can. 
Exactly. You know, it's funny to say that because that was probably the second exposure to a Christmas Carol that I had as a kid or so, because I actually do recall seeing it in theaters back when it came out in 93 or 93 or 94? 92. Okay, 92, right. Because yeah. uh, even though I was little, um, uh, I was I was a fan of the Muppets at that age. Yes. And even seeing that movie, uh, not only did I genuinely like how the Muppets were trying to tell a serious story, Mm-hmm. But I also really got a kick out of Michael Caine as Scrooge. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember seeing it in theaters too. It was one that my parents took us to. And I I loved the Muppets. I used to watch the reruns of the Muppet show uh, growing up. You know, I watched Muppet Babies. And then, of course, Muppet Family Christmas that came out and we'll talk about later. I mean, just all these Muppet things that I used to just really, really love. So when I saw that it, they were going to be doing a Christmas Carol and the same thing, it was my second exposure because my first was, of course, a Mickey's Christmas Carol, which we might be talking about later as well. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I kind of knew the story already. So when they got into it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't unfamiliar. And so it just, I got to enjoy it with that, but also with the trademark Muppet, you know, wit and yeah. and slapstick as well, comedy, you know, as well. So it's just, it's like the whole combo, everything about it, it was just, it was a great package. And yeah, Michael Caine just killed it as Scrooge. Exactly. And because what I find fascinating about the movie too, is the fact that it was kind of a risk considering that this was the first major Muppets project after the death of Jim Henson. And the first, yeah, the very first directorial uh, project for his son and as well. Right. So I'm sure there was a lot of pressure riding on that, considering that that was also the first time Disney ever held any kind of rights on the Muppets. Yeah. So, I mean, you put all that in a pot and you don't expect it to boil, but sure enough, they came up with something great. <laughs> exactly. And another little fun fact, um, because I find the songs you know, great, there are songs that I occasionally find myself humming. Though, if I had to pick a song that I will always remember, it probably has to be the Marley and Marley song. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that one's so Because I will also admit that Stanler and Waldorf are my absolute favorite Muppet characters. They are Something amazing. about their cynicism uh, just always got me, even at uh, age four. <laughs> <laughs> I always liked them. And I did, yeah, I didn't always get their jokes, but I always laughed at everything they did, mostly because they kind of they kind of made fun of Fozzie. And, oh, <laughs> and yeah. Fozzie, but everything about his his whole demeanor would change every time they'd start, you know, heckling him. And so I just it was it was just so funny. They were they were great. Hey, they even got they did give him another one compliment in that one scene, though. They do. After yeah. Speech, it, we uh, loved it. We loved it. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> And that, that's something that I always quote my friends whenever we're watching like any kind of speech and we always wish we could say something like, it was short it, or it was simple. It was dumb. It was short. But I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're Marley and Marley song. It's great. Uh, of course, the Tiz of podcast guys have, have sung that as well on their little uh, album episode. They yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's, it's always, it's an earworm, but in a good way. Exactly. One, and uh, Thankful Heart always got me too with a thankful heart. Da, 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 da. I don't remember the words now. Yeah, I mean, it's a good song, even though Michael Caine is obviously not the best of a of a singer, but yeah. he still sounds very joyful when he sings. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Kind of like how Dwayne Johnson uh, sang in Moana, even though he too is not that great of a singer, right. he still brings in that passion that makes the song. It enjoyable. makes the song. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to be a, you know, an operatic tenor to make it work. <laughs> exactly you just need that passion yes but that was my uh that was my number four let's move on to number three okay number three for me uh, this is going to come off as a tad controversial because i know there are people who do not like this movie that would be Ernest saves christmas <laughs> looking at you anthony <laughs> <laughs> okay Ernest saves christmas and i will admit that it's one that uh i've only seen pieces of um, That's okay. It, it kind of missed me growing up. Um, I, I was never a huge Ernest fan, although I, a lot of my friends were, mostly because when his show was on, there was another cartoon on that I always watched, although I, I don't recall which one at the time. I just remember it was, I was like, oh, it's time to watch, you know, whatever, and I changed it. Oh, yeah, I know. It's Hey, hey Vern, it's Ernest, or, or Hey Vern, it's some, I know it's one of those two titles. Right, right, right. So I would always change it to, to watch, you know, this other cartoon. But, but you know, he was funny, and I always enjoyed him. So Exactly. And for me, because uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I consider this one one of my favorite ones. I okay, mean, it yeah. is nostalgic, uh, considering that the first time I saw this, I actually saw this on the Disney Channel 
while I was staying at the Disneyland Resort uh, sometime back in the mid '90s or so. Uh-huh. And not to mention, um, uh, as soon as I saw that, yeah, I knew I I known about Ernest even at a young age because the guy was just so hammy that you kind of got the idea that he always wanted to bring at least a little chuckle to mm-hmm. most kids. Yes. Maybe some other families. But what also really sells me this movie is also the performance of Santa played by Douglas Seal, who was also the voice of the Sultan in Aladdin. Nice. And even though he too doesn't uh, necessarily play the traditional Santa because uh, he never once wears the famous Santa suit because his whole goal is to travel to Orlando to transfer his magic to this other guy who's about to be, uh, who's supposed to be the next Santa, even though he himself doesn't really know if he, this guy who's talking to him, even is Santa. This whole plot sounds very convoluted and yet it also sounds super simple at the same time. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those movies where easily things could be solved within a few minutes if they really took a second to think about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is why the script had to add Ernest. He had to be that uh, that redneck hope who ends up you know, making every other bad decision, uh, causing a, each little thing. A chain reaction, yeah, I get you. Yeah, and the, not to mention, uh, it's also a movie that, for A Christmas Story, it's odd to see a holiday story that's set in Florida of all places. Right. Uh, but of course, one of the reasons they used Florida was because it was also the very first movie to be shot on the recently opened Disney MGM Studios lot. Ah. And that was at that time when Hollywood was attempting to turn Orlando into Hollywood East. Mm-hmm. And of course, that never really worked it out. Yeah, it kind of failed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but and even even each year, Ernest Sees Christmas is the kind of movie that I do throw into my Christmas ske- uh, schedule. Uh, you know, obviously for nostalgic reasons, mm-hmm. but I also throw it in because something about it still really gives me that you know that nice Christmas feeling, and yeah. I think it really has to do with the the film's ending that actually does have the characters coming all together in the end, and and of course, kind of like Santa Claus the movie. Ernest Saves Christmas is also a very 1980s movie. Even though it's funny because it's very dated, you know, they always do things that that are typical of the era, uh, as opposed to like some of these other movies that are are pretty timeless. Because I mean, you look at like like, like Christmas Vacation and it's same thing. It's it's set, I mean, it's it's very clearly in the 80s and yet Mm -hmm. um, they don't do anything with the exception of maybe some of those, those track suits, yikes. Um, they don't really do anything that, that cements it as 1980s. And so it's kind of timeless in that way. Yeah. And, and what's funny is that as a writer myself, mm-hmm. I always strive to make mo- much of my work as timeless as possible. I right. really don't like putting in modern day references. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for, for something about the you know 80s and 90s, it's different. I mean, it's it's probably nostalgia. And <laughs> I could probably, I'm the kind of guy that throws in as many references as possible, even right. if they look at me going, What's that? And yet, for some reason, when I whenever I bring up Ernest Saves Christmas, I actually do get a fair amount of people who know what that movie is. Yeah, and I remember it being really popular. It just it was one of those. At least for me, it kind of kind of I skipped most of it. Um, sure. Not purposely. It just kind of somehow passed me by. Like I'd sit down and catch the you know a little bit of the end, or I'd just sit down and catch a little bit of the beginning before we had to do something. You know. Um, so it's one of those that I still have to go back and watch the entire thing straight through. And I know Anthony Caruso from Tis the Podcast would would yell at me and say, don't do it, but I'm going to do it, Anthony. I'm sorry. Yeah, because honestly, I would love to sit down with him and just have this giant three-hour debate about the movie. But, <laughs> Anthony, if you're listening to this, I will do it. Uh-oh, challenge extended. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, that's good. My number three, and this is really hard because my top three always rotates. It just depends on what mood I'm in. So sure. for, for tonight, my number three actually is Home Alone. Home Alone. Uh, it's All a right. classic from 1990. Um, I could relate to Macaulay Culkin. Uh, not so much as the, uh, you know, the youngest, but mostly because he was the same age as me. And everything he did was pretty much everything that I would do. Uh, so, you know, I, I always had that, that kind of vibe with it. And then, of course, the score is brilliant. It's mm-hmm. it, it's everything about it. The the comedy, the slapstick comedy about it. You know, with with all the <laughs> all the punishing uh, traps. Uh, all the burglars. And such. I mean, 
there's no way they would have survived any of it. But it's that, like you mentioned, is very Looney Tunes as well. And, uh, you know, I grew up on Looney Tunes. So, I mean, it, it, there's something yeah. about it that just it strikes a chord with me. Like, I could defend my house if I'm all alone. You know, I was the oldest. So it was like, I can protect my brothers. I can do this, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Because I will say that this is also a big one for me because I was actually just about to say that Home Alone was my number three as well. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but I'll, I'll give you my little stance on it that this is the movie that is the very first movie that I recall seeing in theaters. I was only three years old, but I still have very vivid memories of actually going into a theater and sitting down and watching that one. Yes, yes. And that was a movie that uh, I watched so often, even outside the Christmas season. We ended mm-hmm. up buying three different VHSs because I kept wearing out the ones that I had. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Not to mention... Um, uh, the movie stuck with me and my friends and my entire class for the longest of times. You know that coat, that tan coat that uh, Kevin wears when he's like walking yeah. home. Um, so I had that coat, you know, and it's oh, like, really? it had the hood, you know, and it was like red plaid, you know, in the, on the inside. I had it and I hated it <laughs> until I saw the movie. And then all of a sudden I was like, I have that coat. <laughs> I have the same coat Kevin McAllister does. So you don't remember what you don't remember what brand it was, did you? I don't. No, I wish I did. Um, I just I think my mom got it at JC Penney. Uh, okay, because the the jacket itself really screams like LL Bean or uh, or just one of those catalog type things or so. Considering how sure, wealthy the family was. You, well, yeah. The funny thing is, uh, we we were not. So um, it, you know, I really don't think it was probably that brand. Uh, I have a feeling it was just, you know, a heavy coat that they found and it was just probably kind of yeah. brand, whatever. But uh, but yeah, it's just it was one of those that I hated it. I felt huge and thick and I didn't like the hood. Uh, but as soon as I saw him and he was walking with the hood and it was kind of unzipped, so it was laying flat sure, know, yeah. in the two flaps. And so I was like, I can do that. You know? <laughs> Did you ever uh, when uh, when he wore that jacket, did you ever try to recreate that scene where you're walking down the street with the. Uh, shopping bags only for the whole thing to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. Uh, in fact, I kind of hoped for the opposite because I didn't want to have to pick them up. So. <laughs> yeah, even though I always felt bad for that scene because they never exactly show how Kevin got home, though I always assumed that he just removed his jacket and just scooped up everything into like a, making a bag out of his jacket and somehow getting it home. Well, he's very resourceful, so I wouldn't put it past him on doing that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I... And that was actually the genius thing about the script by John Hughes is that he always knew which areas to focus on and which areas not. Right. And in this case, he knew that the development of the story had to be on Kevin semi growing up, even though he's only spending what three days or four days. Just at a home? few days. Yeah. That's yeah. But even that, that time of period can be kind of scary for a kid at that age. Yeah. Especially, I mean, he's all by himself. What's he going to do for food? You know, uh, I mean, just everything about it, you know, he's had to do laundry, uh, I mean, it would be, if I was 10 years old and was in that situation, I would have been the same. Well, yeah, especially considering that without any cell phones, he really uh, genuinely thought he made his family disappear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. the car's still there. They didn't go to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I probably would have had that same opinion, too. Exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. There. You would have thought the same thing, yeah. Yeah, but again, uh, what also really does help sell that movie is the score by John Williams, which for the longest time uh, I always knew was very Christmas scene lovely, but I never quite understood why it always caught on to me. But then I saw a YouTube video a few years ago that really made the comparisons to how much the score really uses Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. The Nutcracker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's fugues in it. Um, that particular cue when they're racing through the airport, you know. Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, I mean that whole that little bit is a lot like Trey Pack, um, the Celestas and Glockenspiels all throughout. Uh-huh. I mean, there's yeah, there's a lot. Uh, in fact, I I believe the soundtrack show just to release part one on the uh, on Home Alone. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, so I'm I'm anxious to hear that. I haven't gotten a chance to hear it yet. Um, but I'm very excited to hear that as well, um, just because I love movie scores. I used to teach a class on film score. Uh, oh, awesome. And so it was, uh, yeah, uh, John Williams is always amazing. So, no, I, I, well, I do have to ask if, uh, if you do include uh, John Williams as a big subject, is Home Alone one of your favorite film scores of all time? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> and it, it actually is not just Christmas scores, but, but uh, film scores in general. It definitely is. Yeah. That's what um, I would have meant too. Yeah. The uh, although Jerry Goldsmith is like my all-time favorite film composer, 
Sure. Yeah. 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 I can't go wrong with Jerry Goldsmith, but uh, John Williams is, is number two. So I can't, you know, I can't deny that he, he can craft a score like nobody's business. <laughs> exactly. Considering uh, just how much other people have never, cause yeah, when you really see other modern Christmas movies, you know, even other scores will still sound nice. I get to really see one that really attempts to replicate that. And honestly, yeah. I think it's because a lot of film, uh, film composers, don't even want to try to replicate it uh, because that's just the kind of sound that a guy that John Williams can make. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's funny because they, I think he, he's really good at crafting uh, a theme, just re- composing a theme that's memorable. And I think the problem with a lot of movie, um, a lot of movie scores nowadays, even with like Marvel movies and stuff, a lot mm-hmm. of their themes aren't very memorable. So you yeah, know, exactly. And, the last uh, real comic book theme that, you know, that, that I think was memorable was uh, Batman from 1989. Of course, I know the Avengers themes, and I know a lot of the themes now because I'm, I love film scores, and so I listen to them all the time. Sure, yeah. But, but you know, you go, you ask your average person, you play, a, a, you know, maybe a, the theme from Iron Man or, uh, you know, something like that, and they're not going to know it. But if you, as soon as you play, you know, Superman, of course, they right away they know that's Superman. And, I, and I, I, a lot of it has to do with the actual main theme. You know, if, if you can get just a catchy piece of, music you know a great melody then you've got it you know and then after that it's exactly. just a matter of weaving it in and out and making it work yeah and that's just something that a lot of modern movies do uh, for some reason they've really neglected the film score out of anything even though that itself can almost be half the entire thing yeah uh you know and it's funny because home alone they they didn't even think they could get john williams you know they were just kind of like uh hey let's ask him see what happens and can you imagine yeah, fact, if the original anyone poster else... home alone had a different composer on there altogether uh Bruce i believe Broughton. Yeah, Bruce Broughton, I think, was supposed to do it. Uh, and then he ended up having a conflict. Of course, as soon as you find out John Williams is available, you go get John Williams. <laughs> yeah, you try. Even if even if you don't think you can get him, you got to ask, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's funny because you, you think about any other composer, even Jerry Goldsmith, I don't think he would have done as good a job as John Williams did there. And I love Jerry Goldsmith. He is a master of atonality and like like serial music but but keeping it in like a primitivistic style just everything and yet i don't think even though he's got some catchy themes i don't think it would have worked and i know we're, we're going a lot uh deeper yeah. into the score than i wanted but uh <laughs> so so that was uh home alone was also your number that was my number three as well Number three all right right on uh well then let's get to number two what okay what's... sounds good okay Go ahead. What's your number okay, two? Okay, well, my number two mm-hmm. happens to be Miracle on 34th Street. Ooh, that's so good. That was my... Are you talking about the remake or the uh, original? Right now, I'm actually talking about the original. Okay, good. That was that was actually my number five tied for Gremlins, and then I, I decided to go with Gremlins just because it was 80s. Well, now here's your chance to talk about it. <laughs> I love this movie. It uh... <laughs> Yeah, it is, considering uh, that it was a movie that almost had everything going against it uh, considering its release date because a little fun fact even though 20th century fox uh, or at least the film crew themselves wanted to get this a december release the head of 20th century fox insisted on a summer release date all because they felt that people would go to the movies more in the uh, summers than they would in the winter well and, and thus, you know that they're, they're not wrong i mean it, it's true you want more people go in the summer than they do in winter yeah um, and of course because of that Marketing had to basically hide the fact it was a Christmas movie. And to be honest, if you were to ask me to hide all the Christmas references, I probably would have said, I'm uh, same out of here. Luck, man. Yeah, yeah, same here. I wouldn't have done it. But they did a great job. I mean, they, I mean, there's that classic, you can find it on the DVD, you know, the, the extras there where, you know, he's talking to different film stars, you know, and she's like, oh, I know women will love it. And then, uh, huh. you know, he meets up with another movie star and, and uh, the, it, uh, a man this time and they're talking. He's like, oh, all I know is the guys will love it. And you know, he's like so confused about like what exactly Miracle on 34th Street is. You know, it's supposed to be the head of the, the, the company. And it's just, it, I mean, it's brilliant marketing because how else... If you're trying to take away the Christmas out of it, how else do you get people interested? You just got to tell other people, <laughs> hey, this movie's great, man. You cannot miss <laughs> this exact, at all. That's exactly right. And that's that's what they did. Uh, I love this one. I think Edmund Gwynn has a twinkle in his eye that I haven't seen re- in really any other movie Santa. Um, so yeah, while I love true. David Huddleston, 
you know, and I think he's fantastic. In fact, I think he's probably the best on-screen Santa I've ever seen. There's something mm-hmm. about Dave, about uh, Edmund Gwynn and just the look in his eyes that he just, it sparkles almost every time you see him. Yeah, well, okay. Well, unlike David Holston, who's obviously a, an ordinary man who eventually becomes Santa, mm-hmm. in the case for Edmund Gwynn, when he walks in, you know, this guy's been Santa for so long that you really get the feeling that he carries the role with such dignity and Mm -hmm. gravitas as if he knows that his position as Santa is so important that, that nothing can wreck this image. Considering that one of his best scenes is one of the beginning scenes where he confronts the Macy's Santa who's already drunk. (laughs) I do love that. Yeah. And considering that he's already ready to beat up this guy um, uh, up until he his internal senses, you know, reminds him oh wait no, there's a whole parade organizer i better go get yeah. someone about this <laughs> this man is intoxicated <laughs> and of course even with all that he never once did he, did he ask to ask for that position uh, he was asked to become that santa the macy's even though he, uh of course he was saying oh can't you find someone else uh yeah. at first not wanting to draw attention you know until he realizes hey this Christmas just might be the most important for me. For yeah, this if one. I don't do this, yeah, it, uh, who will? You know, kind of a thing. You right, can, and then, uh, the children, you know. yeah, and of course, as the movie goes on, you really realize that the other reason that Edmund Gwynn really sells it as Santa is, isn't just him. It's the fact that he really sells the idea that faith in other people is just as important as faith in him. Yeah, 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 it's it's fantastic. I mean, so much so that he won an Academy Award for it. Yep, uh, the only actor to have ever won an Oscar for playing Santa for Claus. For playing Santa, yep. So, I mean, there's something to be said about that. I love his interaction with the, the Dutch girl. Yeah, know, exactly. Uh, um, that, all in a native Dutch. Yep, the, another, that's another great one. And then the chemistry between him and Natalie Wood. I mean, I really felt like that grandfatherly kind of role, you know, w- was taken by him. You know, he, he kind of mentored yeah, exactly. her. And I mean, it was just, it was, it was perfect. It really was. Exactly. Um, uh, considering that, she uh, well, except for her, you know, next door neighbors. Uh, it was just it's always just been her and her mother, and she really didn't have any positive male role models. Right. And of course, you know, when Santa Claus comes in, uh, you know, he is that positive role model, even though she herself has never believed in Santa. <laughs> yes, which <laughs> I I always find like I always laugh when when uh, you know she's talking about giants and uh, you know, and, that, and that whole bit there. Down the next near, near neighbor, like there's no giants. Oh, that was just a clown from last year. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, that whole was, bit. I mean, she was basically the Debbie Downer of that time. Wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, but it plays very well. And so um, that's a great number two, man. That's, that's a good, that's a good one. Mine was uh, a little more uh, nostalgia based with uh, Christmas Vacation. Okay, so, Christmas vacation. Now you know, we got something here. Yes, uh, Clark Griswold, the ultimate family man, trying to recreate the Christmas uh, of his youth. You know, trying to to capture all the feelings and and family and and you know the fuzzy warm memories, uh, and failing miserably, but at the same time succeeding. I mean, it's it's a classic story, and it's something that really every every dad and you know and and husband tries i think and oh and yeah definitely so it to and, me it, it hits home quite a lot because i know i'm always trying to create for my children that same um you know the same kind of feelings that i had when i was their age so it's it's a very powerful movie i think even though it's silly and and uh i, I mean it's very clever and i i kind of feel bad for the director that had to work with chevy chase but at yeah. the same time <laughs> at the same time uh, he did a great job. <laughs> yeah, and that's that was also, and of course, kind of like Home Alone, the genius of the script was also of John Hughes, who really knew how to not just use the story, but more importantly, use the character the of Clark Griswold. Yeah, because if anything, you know, even though this might have turned out as the per- perfect the uh, Christmas for another family, what Clark Griswold forgot to realize, he's a Griswold. He's a guy who's going <laughs> to always consistently face bad luck. Everything yep. that can go wrong is going to go wrong, no matter how much he tries. <laughs> you know whether it's forgetting to bring a you know a, some sort of saw to go cut down the tree or you know thinking he could be the fastest sledder only to tear up half the town <laughs> doing so the uh the the varnish the cereal varnish right <laughs> yeah that was supposed to be like 500 times more slipperier than uh kitchen oil or so <laughs> something like that yeah because <laughs> that's something you hand over to like the military you do not you know give the guys like clark Roswell, but yeah, exactly he just to have, have it because he's in that position 
Yeah, it uh, it's it's funny because you know everyone's trying. You know, Helen is trying, or Ellen, excuse me, Ellen is yeah. trying. Um, the kids are just they're putting up with it, but they're trying their best to make it work. And of course, they're dealing with the the grandparents and uh, right, which can be hard on a lot of kids, especially uh, for a teenager. If you know they're spending their Christmas sleeping on the pullout couch somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And plus, one of my favorite lines, even though I don't get a lot of laughs from other people, I love that line when Audrey's bringing up uh, how how her boyfriend Alexander oh, yeah. called, <laughs> but uh, her grandpa said she can't come to the phone because she's going to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> And every teenage girl would just cringe if that ever happened. Oh, I know they'd die. Yeah. It's, (laughs) I like that line too. You know, and then of course she says, we're all making sacrifices, you know, (laughs) know, like the cigarette and then just, you know, just manages to slice that whole cabbage into (laughs) one powerful strike. (laughs) Ellen, are you smoking? No. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. Um, John Hughes was just a fantastic writer you know, he, he has so many classics to his name um, in this era that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those where he's definitely, I mean, he's in a Hall of Fame. He's got to be, you know, in, the, in Hollywood Hall of Fame somewhere. And if he's not, he will be soon. Yeah. And then, of course, for Christmas Vacation, uh, given, that, um, uh, given that Hughes also wrote that script, uh, mm-hmm. what's fascinating is, uh, I mean, did you know that, uh, I mean, he obviously wrote the first movie, but did you know that despite his name being on it, he actually had no involvement in writing the sequel European Vacation. I did know that. Yeah, I, I yeah, had then, heard and that. And then supposedly his third, the third uh, Christmas Vacation was his way to rectify the situation. I'm guessing because he didn't like the second one, even though I kind of have a soft spot for that one. <laughs> uh, it's funny because out of all of them, the second one is the one I remember the least. And yeah. it's not that it was bad. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. I just um, I remember it the least. I think because I've seen it the least. You know, I saw the probably first, yeah. I, I saw the first. Of course, I've seen Christmas Vacation like a million times. Um, but there was a period I remember where they were showing a Vegas Vacation on HBO like almost every other day. And so, of course, I've seen that one quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, and in, and even on that one, uh, to me, is still the weakest of the vacation movies. Yeah, you know, I, I at least still remember it. And, um, and a lot of it does have to do that it is Chevy Chase, Chevy Chase, and Beverly D'Angelo within these roles of Clark and Ellen. Yeah. yeah, I mean these these were just two people that you really wanted to follow, uh, no matter where they go. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that may also explain why the 2015 reboot Vacation uh, was really bad. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't even know what else to say about that one. <laughs> so yeah, I'm it just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Christmas Vacation, like as you said, it's a movie that I've watched hundreds of times and. I'm probably going to watch another hundred times and not get sick of it. One thing that I do miss about that, or I do um, hope is that they finally release a score to that one because they've never released an official score. They had a soundtrack, but then a lot of the, uh, you know, quote unquote score elements weren't (laughs) actually from the movie. It was from uh, a a different movie. Uh, So it's, uh, I mean, how can you go wrong with that tuba, you know? (laughs) <laughs> you exactly. Know, yeah. Eddie, you just hear the boom, 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 boom. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's so great. <laughs> yeah, and again, going back to John Hughes, he was a guy who also really knew where to where to place his soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Considering that uh, when you listen to Christmas Vacation, uh, you know it's got a great score, and they also knew how to use the right neglected Christmas songs. Yeah, like uh, like the scene just before he you know replugs in the tree to electrocute the cat. If you if you listen to the music. It's this like very old fashioned choir of uh, the Twelve Days of, Days of Christmas, which mm-hmm. you know I was so even though most people wouldn't notice it, when I see it, I'm thinking, man, I've been to a few parties like my grandparents that probably would have put this song. Would have put it on, there. yeah, exactly, yeah, like Lawrence Welk or something, you know, <laughs> or yeah. Ray Conniff, you know, uh, yeah, I I know what you mean. Um, the, it's just it's excellent use of of everything. And I, I mean, I just, I love Christmas vacation. It's just, it's another one of those that if I don't see it, uh, it just doesn't feel like the Christmas season to me. Exactly. And, uh, and to be fair, uh, even though I do catch that one every year, uh, my nearby movie theater would always screen that movie every December and I'd always be the one to go catch it. And of course, now that they're not doing it this year, it's a little disheartening uh, just because, uh, I feel so bad for all these closed cinemas and such. Yeah. But, um, uh, of course, I'm still going to watch the movie uh, however way I can because it's one of the few movies I own 
on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, and I even have a digital copy I can take with me wherever I want. Nice. It's just, <laughs> if I need my Christmas vacation fix, You'll get I, it. Anywhere, anywhere I go, I've got it somehow. There you go. Yeah, we. Uh, it's one of those, my kids are still uh, too young to watch it, so it's one that my wife and I will always watch when they're, once they're asleep. It's like, all right, it's time for Christmas vacation, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was actually a movie that I, I saw when I was fairly younger, like seven or so. Yeah, because well, for some reason, even though my mom uh, he would say, oh, no, no gremlins for you, but for Christmas vacation, oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, I can see how gremlins would scare you. And uh, Christmas vacation, a lot of the adult jokes would just, you know, go over your head. So you could just laugh at the silliness of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think I kind of get it. But yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> so what's number one? Okay. Robert's list of, of favorites. Okay, if I had to pick a number one movie, you know, number one, it's uh, you know, the best of the best, uh, the one movie that I'd have to watch over and over, it actually would have been Christmas Vacation. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, as I've right. said, it's it's a movie that I cannot miss under any kind of circumstance. Uh, yeah. And of course, uh, even though I do have my usual, usual Christmas schedule where I do try to throw in some old ones and new ones mm -hmm. that's a movie i'm also very likely to watch more than once because thankfully i'm not the only fan uh my the rest of my family are fans and nice i'm always going to catch my mother probably listening or watching it once or twice around the holidays i might get my brother watching it once or twice right and maybe even my dad who's not even the biggest movie guy i mean he's the kind of guy who will just go upstairs and watch the news and that's it uh gotcha and and yet I still ca catch him occasionally uh, chuckling at some of the uh, little jokes here and there. Well, it's so funny. I mean, everything about it, it's, you know, it's it, it's humorous, but it's also got a lot of heart. I mean, it's, uh, of course, there's a, a little bit of excitement as well. <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, one thing we didn't even talk about was the fact that uh, the biggest complainer of that whole thing was Clark's father-in-law, um, Art. Art, Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, during the scene where he finally confronts his boss uh, about how bad it was that he just decided to cut out bonuses without telling anybody, his character, Art, was the first one to stand up to actually defend him. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you know what? It's funny because I've seen it a million times and I don't think I've ever really realized that. <laughs> yeah, that despite being the complainer, he really finally saw Clark, you know, as the son-in-law he's always wanted. Some guy who's willing to stand up for himself. Yeah. And you could argue he's been standing up for himself the whole time uh, with the way he's been trying to get Christmas done. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, when you really see him, you know, confront his boss, a guy that could fire him right on the spot and just really just rip into this guy for how bad it was to really screw over all those other employees. Mm -hmm. He finally saw Clark as the man he's always and, wanted to see him as. Mm -hmm. The whole movie is filled with, uh, I, I mean, nostalgia. not But not just for not just for that era, but I mean, even Clark himself, you know, he, when he's trapped in the attic and he's watching those home movies, you know, he, he starts longing for a bygone time. Uh, right. And, you know, and to be fair, I think a lot of us will maybe occasionally want to pop on like a really old home movie to see, you know, Christmases of yonder. And, and mm -hmm. another fun fact, um, uh, I guess there was a YouTube video where Chevy Chase and his family are rewatching Christmas vacation. Oh yeah. <laughs> and his daughter, uh, Cheryl, uh, uh -huh. who I think was in her twenties or so. She told her parents that when they got to that scene, she would always she only saw it once and would always fast forward. And when Chevy Chase chuckled and said, Why do you always skip that? She looked at him and said, Because you're crying in that scene. You're my daddy. I don't like to see you cry. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. But it was also nice to see the you know, see the whole family rewatch his uh, old movie, even though that he's Chevy Chase is obviously older and Seems to be something in a uh, seclusion from Hollywood right now. Yeah, he seems to, uh, uh, be willing to do a lot of uh, chatting about uh, his old movies. Well, you know, and he's always been kind of a a diva, I suppose. And well, uh, yeah, because I know well, most people know that uh, along with being a diva in the '90s, when his big comeback almost happened with Community, he really screwed that up and got himself uh, kicked off that show. Yeah. Which is too bad because I also thought he was funny on Community. I loved him on Community. I, I mean, I loved that show. It's just, it's a great show. But he, yeah, he definitely, he played the villain. He played, uh, you know, the the kind of starting quasi-reformed. Yeah. 
And, and to be fair, that's not necessarily the easiest part to play, no, uh, no. especially when you're supposedly playing a <laughs> unlikable, likable character. So, yeah, you know, a good example of that being uh, Bill Murray's character from Scrooge, who himself is technically a very despicable guy. And yet you still want to follow this guy throughout the entire movie. And the, cha- the that goes to for Chevy Chase and a good amount of his other roles, considering that them, justification, yeah. <laughs> how he's not even necessarily the nicest of guy, considering he's even hitting on this other woman in the lingerie department. <laughs> he was just browsing. Uh, browsing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be but, caught by his son later on. Uh, yeah his face <laughs> he does have the the some of the greatest faces you know surprised and 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 you know comedic faces in in uh, hollywood i, I think yeah we'll and this for is that why area. even though even though i don't know if it's going to happen it would be nice to see chevy chase get in at least one more really good role whether it's a comedy or a drama or so yeah but i'm glad you brought up scrooged because that is my number one oh yeah <laughs> all righty i love scrooged it's it's a christmas carol uh on steroids it's you know it's it's they don't really play with it too much it's it really is just that basic story and yet it's it's set again with this you know this high-powered executive at, at a tv network and and his turn from stepping on the little guy to you know helping out the little guy and oh, right exactly it, everything about it is well done it's got comedy it's got uh, uh suspense it's i mean it's just it's it's got karen allen how do you how do you not you know fall in love with karen allen you know well yeah especially <laughs> with the uh, smile she gives the first time that she enters uh, the whole movie when uh because if you remember, um, uh, I mean, first you know, you know, he called her first from his office. Right. You know, when she comes on, and all you she, hear is her yelling, "Lumpy, Lumpy, yeah. Lumpy," and which really feels like something a you know an old girlfriend might call you if you've been together for a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. In the case of in the case of Scrooge, uh, but yeah, it's a movie that you know I also really like, even though it's not necessarily something I need to see once a year or so, just because. There are so many different versions of A Christmas Carol out there that yeah. I could spend an entire lifetime talking about each and one of them. Oh, for sure. Yeah, though, in the case of Scrooge, uh, even though I didn't see this one until maybe high school back in the like early 2000s or so, it was one of those movies I, I did realize that there aren't too many versions of A Christmas Carol that are set in the modern day. No, most of them tend to keep up the same Victorian era uh, setting and maybe occasionally a cartoon might reset that uh, in a different era or so. But along with trying to really go into the 1980s era uh, to do a Christmas Carol, the movie also does a good job really satirizing the over corporate uh, stylings of of the way these TV specials were were done. Considering uh, considering too that how the whole movie opens up with that the night the reindeer died. I was about to say, you can't go wrong with the night the reindeer died. <laughs> and I'm still waiting for a full-length movie about that. I still want to see that somehow. Me too. Plus uh, Bob Goulet's Cajun Christmas as well. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because even though Bob Goulet is unfortunately no longer with no us, longer so with I'm us, sure they but... could, uh, maybe they could bring in Josh Groban to do his own version of a Cajun Christmas. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's funny because I every single one of those is something I could see on like, uh, this type of network TV. I mean, it, it, they just did it perfectly. Uh, they, they captured it so well, the way he treats his employees and, you know, he's, you know, um, with his own little commercial, you know, acid rain. I mean, everything. <laughs> it's, it's so typical of the 80s. And <laughs> well, that is exactly something a, uh, you know, corporate president probably would would have come up with just so they can get people to watch something. And... Exactly. Because yeah. I think I think the the whole scene, the whole commercial, was based off of that recent TV movie, uh, The Day After, the one that scared everybody about the whole uh, Cold War and the fact that if bombs dropped, it would have been bad for everybody. And yes, yeah. So it, yeah, it and uh, they really they play off that. They play uh, with the Tiny Tim character as well. You know, exactly. So. Um, uh, considering how uh, rather than making them, uh, you know, just really sick and a cripple like the old version here, they make him a kid who I think has autism. Some, he's gone through some trauma. He he witnessed his uh, his dad uh, murdered, I believe. Uh, and you know, it's 
you know, it just, he, he doesn't talk after that. And so it's, it's like, wow, that's something you don't really see in the, in a Christmas Carol. But uh, again, you also don't really see that in many movies in general, you know, where a kid. Right. Exactly. Like yeah. Even though there are people who do um, uh, get traumatized to the point where they can't even talk about something anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only other film I can think about is Tommy, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. opera, you know, uh, but yeah, yeah, I was also going to say, too, that uh, what does make Scrooge interesting, it's the only version of A Christmas Carol that may have two Bob Cratchit characters. Because, you have, of course, you have uh, you have the uh, oh, tiny, tiny Tim's mother here, the assistant. Grace plus Elliot Grace. Loudermilk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, of course, uh, the other one would be Bobcat Goldsmith. Yeah. Or, who uh, is clearly having the worst day and considering how it ends with him just <laughs> coming back with a shotgun, just ready to kill everybody. <laughs> Uh, i'm looking for francis w cross <laughs> i can't do his voice but <laughs> it's so funny but then the ghosts themselves i mean they're so typical of new york and and i, I mean he they turn the ghosts uh, you know on their head as well we got the cab driver who's a ghost of christmas past yeah we've got uh you know the fairy you know uh, oh, bernadette peters uh, uh carol kane Oh, Carol Kane. I'm off. Yeah, yeah. I get those two mixed yeah. up. Yeah, I know. I do too. Uh, for the longest time, I, I could have sworn uh, Carol Kane was in Pink Cadillac, but oh. <laughs> that one's Bernadette Peters. Uh, but anyway, so so yeah, it's it's you know she's like hilarious. She just beats him up, you know, which is like a far cry from what we normally get. You know, the the almost Santa Claus esque, you know, uh, stately gentleman, you know, with in the green robes. That, <laughs> that's typical. Well, yeah. Of, well, considering of, yeah. that uh, Carol Kane is certainly one of those actresses who is so physical that she has spent her entire career playing crazy people, whether it's it's her playing Grandmama in the Adams Family movies, oh yeah, or yeah. or even playing uh, the landlord in that uh, Netflix show Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. I haven't seen that one. I oh, remember that one's her really funny. from uh, the Princess Bride. She was married to Billy Crystal. You know, she was Miracle Max's wife. Oh yeah, um, uh, I, I forget that she's in that movie too. It's it's been a little while since I've seen that one, even though I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know liar. It's, it's another one of those. You know, she just she's got that distinct voice, uh, and then of course because it's set at a TV network, they they play on that as well with the Ghost of Christmas Future and you know that whole TV screen face kind of thing. So yeah, which I, still I, came off as really genuinely scary. It was creepy. Stuff. Yeah, it really creeped me out. Uh, that gigantic skeleton hand, you know, that's about to grab him. And then Elliot comes in to, to try to hunt him with the shotgun. Or what I about mean, when he just opens the robe and just sees all those like souls just trapped within his uh, rib cage? Oh, yeah. <laughs> only for Bill Murray to stop and then just take another look just to make sure if he saw what he saw. And then I think he says, uh, did our people do that? <laughs> <laughs> People are going to uh, put in notices about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, yeah, it's another one that, uh, again, it's just, it's it's brilliant. Um, so, but on that note, I know we have still have a lot to get through. So uh, um, <laughs> I will go ahead. What about your, your least favorite movies from the 80s? What, what would you okay, say uh, from uh, that era. Well, let's get my little list here. Now, of course, these are movies that aren't aren't even on my favorites, uh, but these are just movies that I recall seeing maybe once or twice, uh, or only recently caught, but decided they were really bad. Uh-huh. Okay, so number three is another TV movie called It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Yes, that's actually my number three as well. <laughs> yeah, with Mickey Rooney? With Mickey Rooney, yes. <laughs> yeah, that was a movie that I only caught last year um, uh, when I was just browsing through a variety of Christmas movies just so I can find something to watch or so. I just remember it being very forgettable. I, you know, it, and, and uh, which is a shame because I, I really like Mickey Rooney. Uh, I, you know, I like when he plays Santa Claus. Uh, I True, think he, yeah. He's generally a likable guy, but I, I mean, I just, it was one of those that as soon as the movie was done, I was like, what happened? It just, you know, it it was a very forgettable film for me. It was just too bad because the idea of a guy coming back from heaven to try to find this fallen angel somewhere in New York is not a bad idea for a it's, story. Yeah, on paper, it sounds great. Uh, I think the execution was just very poor. Exactly, because the whole thing just felt like a whole hour and a half of nothing, uh, considering that even the way the New York City is shot this time just feels very, very 
grit. Well, maybe not the right kind of gritty that uh, I would have appreciated from something like Scrooge or so. Yeah. New York here just seems very, uh, it just seems very ugly looking. It just seems like the kind of cityscape that you really don't want to spend your holidays in. I have a feeling it wasn't shot in New York or if it was shot in New York, they, they had a very limited time frame to shoot and they're just like, shoot here, come on, go, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, and I don't know and, if that's uh, true. That's just the vibe I got. <laughs> exactly. And even though when I really think I consider Mickey Rooney, uh, you know, even though he's a very likable guy, here I just really feel like he's phoning it in. Uh, like he yeah. clearly took this as a paycheck. Uh, yeah, he just he needed the memorized money. his yeah. lines in like three weeks and just went through each scene as a, as it would have read on the script. Well, especially when you compare it to some of his other works, you know, and uh, everything else he's done where he just has this energy, you know, uh, in some of those old ones, uh, those old movies where he would come out with Judy Garland, you know, I mean, it was just, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, he had that, that, pizzazz even as when he played the voice of santa there was more in uh in that voice than there was i think in this and i i mean i literally just remember as soon as it was done changing the channel being like yeah uh, what did i watch and huh. it just it was you know it was one of those kind of things and so that's that was why i put it down as my number three yeah and, and going back to what you were saying earlier even uh, in his later ages like not too long ago i was re-watching the episode of the simpsons where mickey rooney was on and uh, that nice. was the one uh, where uh, Millhouse became Fall Out Boy for the movie adaptation. Yes. Yeah. And then it ended with Mickey Rooney trying to play him, uh, doing the Jiminy Jillikers, Jiminy <laughs> Jillikers, Jiminy Jillikers, with the crew just saying, we're shutting this down. <laughs> oh, my eyes, the goggles do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, it, it came upon men like Claire was, okay, if a whole boat's Christmas was like the high point, then it came upon the midnight clear as it seems to be point. the yang to that yang or gotcha. whatever that uh, statement is. Well, what about number two? What do you have for number two least favorite? Number two happens to be Prancer. Okay. Yeah, it's Not a movie favorite. that uh, it's another one that I didn't see until I was maybe in middle school, which to be fair is the wrong age to watch something like that. Yeah, I definitely but agree. I, I, I hadn't seen it uh, until this year. So, oh, really? Yeah. That's another yeah, which one is that... again too bad because the, the again the idea of a young girl finding a reindeer and assuming that it might be someone else's hand is it's not a bad idea. Yeah. But uh, not only does the film just move at a snail's pace, it is just <laughs> it, boring beyond comprehension. It definitely does. Yeah. It's yeah. it takes its time. Uh, yeah. It even in the case of time. Sam Elliott, a guy I absolutely love, is just too unlikable to really sympathize with. <laughs> So you didn't think he sold it at the end when he's like, maybe he rejoined Santa's sleigh. <laughs> I, part of me really feel, I wouldn't be surprised if that was either uh, maybe in the first draft that got rewritten around and then maybe the studio found it and had him say that line or so. Because uh, typically with Sam Elliott, the guy's good at reading most lines, but that's just that's just something I'm just not going to remember from him for. It, it's funny because he's done so much, but out of all of his book, the thing that I remember most is uh, him as as Ron Dunn in Parks and Recreation. Oh yeah, <laughs> Ron, Ron. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Your spirit animal is a baby snow owl. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's I don't, and it's it's a shame because he's you know he's done so so many good things. Uh, even if you go back to that that terrible Ang Lee. Hulk, you know, where he plays. Uh, oh yeah. You know, you know, oh, General there. Ross. Yeah, even there, I thought he was he was brilliant as General Ross. Um, e even then, you know, I just I, for some reason I can't not think about him as like the anti Ron Swanson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But yet he still manages to play, uh, you know, totally off type here. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, maybe I'll have to cover this in another another episode of my podcast. But I w would like to know exactly uh, what happened to. Him, uh, you know why uh, why that film prancer entered the way it was considering that after the film came out um uh one of the reasons i never saw it because i actually couldn't find a copy of it for many years oh because wow. it wasn't available on dvd uh the video stores that went back when they were open they never had that movie and yeah. even netflix for a while didn't even carry that or streamed it in any way it was just a movie that you know for for Okay, maybe I do know for the right reasons. Uh, maybe the studio was ashamed and really didn't want to put this out. And yet, when the 
like four fans of it, you know, just wouldn't stop protesting. They finally had to <laughs> get out something, anything. It's, fu- it's funny because I, I mean, it's not my favorite, but I kind of liked it. Um, again, it's not something I'm going to watch every year. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, you know, I didn't I didn't hate it. it I thought it was kind of cute. I could see my daughter in that role. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it is very slow. Very yeah, slow. And, yeah, yeah. And, that, and to me, that's... Well, considering that a movie like Prancer is obviously aimed for kids, part of me is wondering, would most kids even be into a movie like Prancer, given how slow it is? Yeah. Especially when you compare it to more modern uh, animated movies that tend to be a bit uh, more fast paced. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's like breathe, guys. Breathe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what about, well, my number two actually is um, Silent Night, Deadly Night, which it's, it's one of those that one of those movies I love to hate. It's like, uh, you know, I kind of secretly enjoy it, but as a Christmas film, I just, I, I don't, I don't like it as a Christmas film. Like I would watch it more as like a Halloween film. So uh, that's the only reason it's, it's kind of uh, in, okay. in this category, but you know, it's just the, uh, the, the, the crazed Santa killer guy. And, and sure, the thing yeah. that, that stuck out most to me, of course, uh, I, cause I remember going to the video store and seeing it, you know, the, the, the ax and, and the Santa. Oh, the ax coming out of the chimney. Coming out of the chimney. Yeah. Um, but the thing that stuck out to me most uh, was the, um, the, the grandpa when he's warning, you know, ab- about Christmas Eve, you know, that, that was like the, you know, watch out for Santa Claus, you know, <laughs> he's got that, the real high pitched, but kind of breathy, scratchy voice, uh, that always just stuck with me. Uh, as far as like a Christmas film though, it, to me, it just, it doesn't hit, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely more along the, in the, in the vein of uh, Halloween and, and uh, you know, that kind of slasher. Film. So more or less just kind of a horror film set around Christmas, but yeah. not necessarily a Christmas movie. Exactly. And, and I, I, I think that they could have, at least for me, cause I know I'm sure a lot of people really like it. I'm sure a lot of people um, would see this as a Christmas film, um, but I think they could have just played up the Christmas in it more. And I think it would have been more successful. Yeah, maybe. I mean, to be to be fair, I have actually have never seen Silent Night, Deadly Night, but I've seen clips of it or so. Oh, okay. And, yeah, yeah. and even from what I've seen, um, uh, I, I I think I just find the film uh, maybe a little too grim to even yeah. be uh, uh, to that be memorable uh, slasher movie or so. Yeah, yeah. And I, I get that. I totally get that. It, you know, it's it's it was at that time where they were just trying to capitalize. You know, Halloween was super successful. Uh, so, so of course they came out with nightmare on Elm street and, and Friday yeah. the 13th. And so then they just kind of started churning out, you know, um, you know, Valentine's day and, and then April fool's day and, and all the, or it wasn't called Valentine's day. I forget what it's called, but, uh, oh, my bloody know, Valentine. Yeah. That one with the, with the minor, you know, uh, yeah. anyway, all these, you know, they just started churning these out and, uh, just trying to capitalize on that. And, and I think if they had just put a little more thought into it. I think it could have been a really great film, but in the end, it just kinda... Yeah, possibly. Uh, do you remember if... Uh, did, did this film come out first or did Black Christmas come out first? Uh, Black Christmas came out first. It was in 74. Okay, so while it wasn't necessarily the first one, uh, the only thing I do know about Silent Night, Deadly Night is that it apparently it was controversial when that one, that one came out or so. Yeah, I think there was several warnings uh, uh, and, and protests and things like that, uh, if, if I recall correctly. Right, because it is kind of a gutsy move to try to have a serial killer, you know, dressed up as Santa. Claus. Santa, yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine the children? Well, I mean, even the, I mean, for a while there, I, you know, when I remember, I, I'm, I'm glad I saw it a little bit later because I, I know, uh, you know, for a while there, if I had, if I had been a kid, I would have been terrified, you know, just out of my mind. And oh yeah so i know, think for that reason uh hollywood's never really wanted to commit to any like major like christmas horror movies uh, or at least uh the big studio ones or so considering right yeah that. i think krampus was like the you know the first one in a while and i know it had sequels it was silent night deadly night i think like all the way through like five or something. garbage day yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes uh which i remember from the uh the merry melee uh yeah. but <laughs> but but yeah, it uh, it had a bunch of sequels, uh, you know. But so did all the other slasher films. And so, okay. Right. On. Well, what's your number one uh, least favorite? Okay, my number one least favorite movie, uh, you know, from this era, has to be Disney's One Magic Christmas. Ooh, I completely forgot about that. That's a good choice. Yeah, I it's have picked um, that one. <laughs> mine, yeah, mine well, one super controversial. So, uh, <laughs> well, considering that. Uh, I saw that once as a kid, uh, mm-hmm. completely forgot about it. 
then I decided to give it another watch, I think like four years ago, and I totally forgot just how depressing that movie really is. With uh, Mary Steenburgen, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah the whole yeah. movie revolved around uh, her and her husband. They were both out of work, and she and the kids had to move out of this like company house by the end of the holiday season, and because they were falling on hard times, the mother was just really glum and grim about the holidays, yeah. really didn't want to make any major commitments. Yeah. And because uh, the husband wanted to open up a new bike shop, but she does not want to use their limited money just to go on a, on this whole business idea. Which, and, uh, I mean, you can't blame her for, you know, it makes. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Exactly. It's just that, uh, you know, of course, once this cowboy angel comes in to try to fix everything. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the, you know, I don't know what I, I don't know why they went with this actor, but the cowboy actor they went with comes off as more creepy than uh, heartfelt. <laughs> when in when in doubt just stick a cowboy angel in the movie <laughs> <laughs> not in this case uh whenever he comes on screen with each kid i always feel like i just really get a i really want to get a police officer to, you know get these kids away from this man because he's yeah. either gonna you know kidnap him or <laughs> something worse or something it's funny because there's there's a few movies out there you know where angels come down and try to help and uh I really don't think there's been a very successful one except for it's a wonderful life you know that's yeah, true <laughs> And it's every uh, every movie that tries that is obviously stealing from that, and yet yeah. ironically, they never really quite understand, you know, how to do angels uh, on, the, yeah. on the big screen. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, in the case of One Magic Christmas, uh, you know, as grim as it gets, it unfortunately gets even grimmer when uh, you know Christmas Eve comes, and not only the, is the husband uh, killed, but the kids are kidnapped too. And uh. and even though I under I totally understand why you know she's going through this whole journey. And yet I keep thinking there had to be a better way to really get her to see the magic of Christmas. And, right. and of course, you know, once the kids are rescued and they decide there's only one man that could help us, Santa Claus, which <laughs> is already just such a forced line or so that when they finally do to go see Santa, you know, not only is the North Pole not magical at all, it's more like an office, just very yeah. boring office. Yeah. But even when they do show Santa, this Santa just appears very frail and old and it almost makes you feel bad for the fact that he's even standing up and <laughs> I, I don't want to picture my Santa as frail and old. No, he's supposed to be jolly and plump and, and just everything about him is supposed to, you know, exude uh, just, just the, the love, you know, and, and excitement and, and joy. And so it's just, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just that each time these kids are talking to him, I totally expect the Santa to, you know, either go, what, what? <laughs> or if uh, the kids were to get on his case, he probably would go, oh, come on now. I'm old. I'm tired. I don't want to do this. Where's my paycheck? <laughs> and then, well, and of course, uh, by the end, uh, you know, when things, <laughs> yeah, when things are changed in the end, uh, I just don't really genuinely feel like Mary Steinberg had really learned her lesson or anything like that. Yeah. It all feels like it comes together way too safely, uh, way too quick of a time. And, you know, to its credit, uh, the mid the early eighties was not the best time for Disney. That was just at that point where they had a lot of not very great films. Yeah. And even then, I, I don't even think this was even an official Disney production. I think the, it was a Canadian movie that Disney picked up to oh, distribute. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, which would explain why the film has a darker, grimmer tone than their other holiday stuff. Well, what was that one the, uh, the Disney did? Um, it's like The Watcher in the Woods or something like that. Well, yeah. Because I know that was that time when Disney was trying, um, trying some more to risky push, maneuvers. Because yeah. that was around that time when they'd also tried uh, Watcher in the Woods, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, which I yeah. really like. And of course, uh, one of their biggest cult hits, Tron. Oh, I love Tron. Tron is yeah, amazing. And, um, I got to find but, a way to link that to Christmas because I want to do Tron so bad. Because <laughs> it would be it would be awesome if they somehow you know came out with a very Tron Christmas. But that also depends whether even programs even celebrate Christmas or so. <laughs> you know what? I have a feeling someone got it for Christmas somewhere. It's got to count somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I have and, a very loose definition of you know. Uh, how to link things to Christmas, but uh, no, that's good. And my number one, um, again, is very controversial. Is actually a Christmas story, and it's not really a bad movie. Uh, I just don't really like it, mostly because my mom didn't like it, and so we didn't grow up with it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so every time it was on, it's just like, okay, what else is on kind of (laughs) a thing. Uh, And I've had the pleasure of watching it um, a couple of times since then. And it's still not my favorite, but I do like it more now. Um, But it's just that whole, the, that whole scene when they go to um, um, what's the name of that store? Uh, Higby's Higby's they go to Higby's and the, you know, that whole Santa North pole thing is just like huge mm-hmm. turn off. I mean, they're so rough with the kids and they don't care. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean, it, I can it, understand that. And to be fair, my opinion is about, about the same as yours. Cause it's another movie that I don't necessarily hate or even consider it that bad of a movie. Uh-huh. It's just not a favorite of mine uh, for a lot of reasons, but I think it's because I, I don't find Ralph that sympathetic of a character. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. And not to mention, um, um, even then I just find something about the movie. It's one of those movies that feels a little too close to home, you know, whether it's the uh, younger brother, you know, crying uh, half the time over, uh, you know, his clothes or his uh-huh. food, even though I really just want to, you know, get this kid a lollipop to keep him quiet. <laughs> yeah. And of yeah. course, uh, the other issue too is that because it's uh, we we're trying to learn more about Ralph through the narrator and not through Ralph's voice, we really don't know much about Ralph as a character other than he really wants this Red Rider. He just BB wants gun. his toy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, the, I mean, the one I guess I will say though that even though I didn't like the movie when I first saw it, you know, watching it years later, I can at least come to appreciate the movie because of the fact that it's. Well, one, one of the few cult Christmas movies to go out of obscurity and uh, something that was more famous. Mm-hmm. And not to mention, it's also one of the few movies that really does recreate the Norman Rockwell painting style. Yeah, and they do a great job with that. The whole color palette, everything about it is is very, very much Norman Rockwell. And I think that's why so many other countries don't really get it. You know, it's it's very Americana. Uh, and, and so, you know, I... Whenever you talk to people, you know, from Europe and stuff like that, and they're they're talking about a Christmas story, it's just not really big on their radar. And well, I, right, yeah, and, and, and I mean, it makes sense. It's just it's very much you know American, um, it, and so there's something about it that it's just it clicks more with uh, with us than it does with yeah. everyone else. And and yeah, I get it. It's just you know, again, my mom couldn't stand it so we just never saw it and so it just kind of i didn't grow up with it and i just, just don't really have very much love for it yeah and of course it doesn't really help that because of the fact the film is now more famous it's now over marketed and over commercialized like crazy because uh i i can't imagine how many times i've seen the fragile box or the oh, leg yeah. lamps because uh, sometimes i get really sick of seeing that image around the holidays <laughs> yeah and the fact too that hollywood keeps trying to you know milk that franchise whether they did that direct to dvd sequel or uh, or that live tv special that fox tried a few years ago that oh, yeah. really came out bad <laughs> well and you know what uh to to the actor's credit uh, i they all had a chemistry that um that worked for that film that i don't think they were able to capture in that remake uh you know it's yeah just, it's true it's, and it's, and and even though um, uh, I could tell the actors in the uh, remake were trying, it's it's just one of those things where you can't, because even though I don't see it as lightning in the bottle, there are people that do see it as lightning in the bottle. And yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's like trying to remake, because uh, even though I, I've heard plans that they might be doing a remake of Scrooge, but I know it's not going to come out as good as the original. No, no, for sure. No, I mean... Yeah, it, Bill Murray, you can't, you can't replace Bill Murray. You know, I mean, it's just, it's something, everything about him, he's got that, that manic energy that just makes it work, you know? And so it, uh, I mean, I, I, I'd still watch it, but I'd probably be pretty disappointed. (laughs) Yeah. And, and even though I do come to appreciate, uh, you know, what a Christmas story has brought, it's not on my Christmas schedule, probably because it's on TV all the time. It doesn't need to be on my schedule. I'm probably going to end up uh, watching at least part of it. uh, Yeah. Maybe if I'm wandering through my kitchen or maybe if I'm channel surfing, I'll see TBS's 24-hour marathon. 24 hours, they yeah. Always I, do. I have a friend who uh, always, like, makes sure that she falls asleep to it, like, every <laughs> Christmas Eve. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's cool, and I'm glad people love it. It's just it's, – it's not my favorite. Yeah, and, and I get that. But I have to – you know, out of all these here, and I know this is kind of hard, but what would you say would be your hap-hap-happiest memory out of all these? If you had to pick just one – 
Home Alone. Definitely Home Alone because that was, as I've said, it was the very first movie that I recall seeing in theaters. Awesome. That's that's a great one. Uh, for me, it would probably be um, Christmas Vacation, watching it with my family. Uh, I remember I hadn't seen it in a couple of years because uh, I was away at college. And when I came back, we all we popped it in and it was like we had never gone away. It was it was perfect. So well, nice. Be, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but now we come to my favorite part of the show, which is a little segment I like to call gag me with the spoon. So this is oh. where we do our uh, best impression of our least favorite <laughs> <laughs> part it could be any one of the, the the things that you picked we'll put it up to the voters they can decide who will win winner gets a totally rad christmas sticker unless i win in which case i get nothing but i still haven't won yet so i think you're fine okay um, <laughs> but just kind of set up the scene for us and as a guest i'll let you go first okay well i already ranked number one as christmas vacation and for me the my least favorite scene is the scene where clark is talking with his uh, work buddy like it's just before part uh, Clark has the pool dream or so. Uh, uh-huh. It's where he's talking to his buddy on the last day of work, and they're they're just talking about uh, whether he got his bonus. And of course, as soon as you know, Clark's asking, "Did you get your bonus yet?" The guy just simply responds, "I talked to my son the other day. Mel 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 guy came in and said something came along. Did you get yours? Just a just a nod, just a no." And he's like, "Well, I'm sure if it's not there, it'll be there soon." And I. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, there is. I mean, even though it's, it's not that bad of a scene, it's just that there's not that much fun. It's funny about this there's scene. There's no it's, energy in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, as they're going back and forth, the guy, it's like you could tell he's just resigned to life. He's going through the motions and he's Plus, acting. it's another right. scene that you could have cut from the movie and nothing would be lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they could have streamlined it. Uh, that's good. For me, um, I, I ended up going with a Silent Night, Deadly Night, and it was oh. a grandpa. And uh, and I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna try my best here. But he goes, uh, "You see Santa Claus tonight? You better run, boy. You better run for your life." <laughs> it's so high pitched and breathy. I can't do it. It's just one of those that uh, it scared the heck out of me. And so I see it now, and it's like ridiculous. It just it's it's something. It's so melodramatic and over the top that it's like okay. It it just doesn't play out, but back then it scared me. So uh, that's I bet so. That's definitely my least favorite. But now I will leave it up to you, uh, listeners, and you can see which one of us will will uh, get a totally rad Christmas sticker. <laughs> Spoilers, Gotta make that plug. It's probably in. not gonna be me. <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, but you know now I really do have to ask, uh, GI Joe. They taught us that uh, knowing is half the battle. What do you think the other half is? Eating a good sandwich. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, it's definitely better than mine. Mine was, uh, if knowing is half the battle, the other half is enjoying your family's movie and TV traditions, whether you like them or not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, Robert, it's been a lot of fun. You know, talking oh, yeah. To you. I, I had a great time on here. And uh, I just, I, you know, I got to say, what do you want to plug? Like, tell me about your show. Well, okay. Uh, for the uninformed. Behind the Bells is my brand new podcast that goes into the histories of your favorite Christmas movies and TV specials. For example, in the very first episode that I've released, it's still available. It's going to be available for a while, and not to mention part two is coming out. But my first episode covers the Santa Claus, its history on how the idea didn't come from Disney. It came from two writers who had not yet made their name. But yeah, I came up with a good idea about a, a man who had to take up the role of Santa and how even uh, doing so uh, and selling their script, how they didn't even consider Tim Allen until the script seemed to have fallen into his uh, manager's hands somehow. And then even from there, um, uh, as luck would have it, Tim Allen just had that connection with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who, along with being the head of Disney at the time, was also the producer on Home Improvement and thus was that magic ticket to getting that movie made. But even then, uh, shooting-wise, there were still a lot of interesting things that happened there, including uh, the fact that Tim Allen was not as jolly as he appeared in the movie. Uh, in fact, <laughs> because he had to, the guy had to wear a fat suit in the middle of summer in, in an unseasonably warm Canada, there was apparently a lot of cursing, a lot of times where he would rant right in front of those kids that were playing the elves. Yikes. <laughs> and considering the fact, too, that uh, that by the end, Disney knew that this was a giant risk of a movie because along with the fact that they hadn't made their own Christmas movie in a while, 
Tim Allen had not yet, you know, started in his own movie yet, and thus uh, they weren't even sure if he could carry that just yet. And in my other podcast, I even mentioned that before they came to Tim Allen, they had considered several other actors, including Bill Murray and Kurt Russell. <laughs> and of course, um, Bill Murray um, uh, turned it down because he had just finished Scrooged and didn't want to do another Christmas movie. And Kurt Russell, I mean, I guess he said no, but he would later get to uh, play Santa in those Christmas Chronicle movies. Yeah, which I enjoy. I actually, Yeah, and I, I enjoy those too. Yeah. But otherwise, um, uh, go and listen to Behind the Bells and uh, keep listening if you want to hear more stories about your favorite Christmas classics. And I just may dwell into some other movies too. Where can they find you? Well, they can find me on iTunes, on Behind the Bells podcast. They can find me um, uh, on YouTube, also on Behind the Bells podcast. And I'm in the process of currently getting myself up on Google uh, for the Google podcast and Android. Right on. And uh, what about social media or anything? Well, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram, uh, where uh, I do post at least once a day, uh, usually something holiday related, but sometimes if I feel like it, I will post whatever I want. <laughs> That's, that's kind of what I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's not really Christmas, but it's eighties. All right. I'll put that in there. <laughs> right on. And so they can just look up behind the bells. Yep. Behind the bells podcast. Robert, thank you so much. Definitely check out his, his page. It was, uh, uh, you know, and in his podcast, it was uh, a really great time. I mean, I learned lots about the, uh, you know, I, uh, apparently the movie was really going to start with the murder. Um, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. You learn a lot of cool tidbits and history about, uh, your favorite classics. So yeah, for sure. Check him out. Um, and on that note, I'm going to end it by saying you can be too old for a lot of things, but you're never too old to check us out on our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're feeling like Clark finding the perfect tree, leave us a review on iTunes. Not only does it help us reach more people, but you also get a free sticker. Now don't forget to vote later, dude.